Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Creation Myths. I have a real classic for you today, because today we are going to cover the creation myth of irreducible complexity. So let's introduce this topic. The modern form of irreducible complexity was proposed by Dr. Michael Behe in his 1996 book, Darwin's Black Box. There has since been, uh, I think there was a 10-year anniversary edition of this, I think, so there's an updated version, um, but this is the original uh, cover for Darwin's Black Box. So let's look at how Behe defines irreducible complexity and why it is supposedly a challenge for evolutionary theory. Here is Behe's definition of irreducible complexity straight from Darwin's black box. And I want to be very clear, I'm going to be operating off of Behe's definition. This is the canonical definition of the modern version of irreducible complexity. And I say the modern version because this is kind of a variant of older uh, design kind of arguments. Um, it's a little more uh, formal than those older arguments, though. Um, but some people will say that Behe didn't actually come up with this idea of irreducible complexity. So we're going to say Behe came up with the modern variant of this idea, and this is his definition. We're using his words, and we're going to really parse them to make sure that nobody can accuse what I'm doing here of straw manning. So Behe writes, By irreducibly complex, I mean a single system which is necessarily composed of several well-matched interacting parts, that contribute to the basic function, wherein the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. An irreducibly complex system cannot be produced directly, that is, by continuously improving the initial function, which continues to work the same mechanisms by slight successive modifications of a precursor system, because any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is, by definition, non-functional. He goes on. There's no gap in the text between these two parts. I just can't fit them all in one slide. He goes on. An irreducibly complex biological system, if there is such a thing, would be a powerful challenge to Darwinian evolution. Since natural selection can only choose systems that are already working, then if a biological system cannot be produced gradually, it would have to arise as an integrated unit in one fell swoop for natural selection to have anything to act on. So what Behe is saying here, is if you cannot build a biological system, pick whatever system you want, can't build that system little bit by little bit, continuously increasing the function as you go, then that system cannot evolve via Darwinian evolution. Now, there are a bunch of problems here, and I promise you we're going to get into them. So you may be thinking, wait a minute, yes, we're going to get there. So let's talk about why it's wrong. You can interpret Behe's argument in three main ways. There's actually a fourth minor way. I'll get to that all the way at the end. But there's three main interpretations of the anti-evolution argument that Behe is making. All three interpretations are wrong for different reasons. We're going to go one at a time and see why. So, option one. Most evolutionary mechanisms are omitted from Behe's argument. Behe's definition, if you just read it plainly, omits most evolutionary mechanisms from consideration in terms of being able to build a complex biological system. So I'm going to, again, quote what he wrote, and then we're going to kind of parse it a bit, and we're going to see exactly what he is including and excluding. So he wrote, an irreducibly complex system cannot be produced directly. It is by continuously improving the initial function, which continues to work the same mechanisms by slight successive modifications of a precursor system, because any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is, by definition, non-functional. Let's break this down, because this is really the crux of the matter for this first uh, version of irreducible complexity. So let's go line by line. In other words, an irreducibly complex system cannot be produced directly, that is, by continuously improving the initial function. We're going to pause right there because there's a lot buried in those couple of lines. What this is saying is we're assuming what's called a constant fitness landscape. In other words, we're assuming that there is selection for a specific trait, and that selective pressure is constant over time. This trait is good, this other trait is bad, so you're gonna see selection for the good trait, and you're not gonna change what is harmful or beneficial in that particular environment. That's simply not true in real life. In real life, selective pressures change over time. So what works at one point in time or in one place. 
does not work at a different point in time or at a different place. This right here in this sentence, we're also excluding acceptation because he's saying we have to continuously improve the initial function. Well, we know there are biological systems that can appear via acceptation, which is where it does one thing and then it is co-opted to do a different thing. I love the example of feathers for this, where feathers were initially for thermoregulation and only later did they uh, start being utilized for flight. This uh, sentence, same line, is also excluding from consideration neutral evolution, changes that accumulate that are not being selected for or against. We know you can have variation accumulate via neutral evolution, and then later some of those variants can actually acquire functions. And the last thing we're saying right here is he's excluding functional intermediates. He's saying it can't be produced by continuously improving the initial function. So you can't have a little bit of a function and then a little bit more and then a little more and then a little more and ultimately arise at, uh, arrive at the, the kind of form as it exists right now. This is basically the what good is half an eye argument, but it turns out that half an eye is pretty darn good. Uh, sure, you might not be able to see, right, images or perceive images, but if you can detect light and dark, as many organisms can, that's useful. If you can detect degrees of light and dark, that's useful. If you can detect the source of light, that's useful. So you can have functional intermediates that aren't the full trait, but they're still beneficial. They're still more helpful than having nothing related to that trait. Continue, again, this is directly continuing now, right? So can, approving the initial function, which continues to work the same mechanisms, work the same mechanisms. So now we're saying not only are you excluding a bunch of processes, you can't even use different things when you're evolving a system. You can't use a different gene, you can't use a different enzyme. It has to be the same basic mechanism as you uh, evolve a feature. By slight successive modifications of a precursor system, this, he doesn't come out and say it, but what he's strongly implying here is you're only considering single base point mutations. You're only considering changing one base into another in the DNA. You know, A mutates to G. But we're excluding from consideration then by slight successive modifications, we're excluding things like gene duplications and other large scale changes to the DNA. And we know that those types of changes are the sources of variation that can then be selected for. This is not a serious argument. Why not? Well, here's a figure that I use when I teach intro-level evolutionary biology. It shows kind of the breakdown of evolutionary theory into three main eras, right? So you've got Darwinism, you've got the modern synthesis, which is not modern anymore, that's from the 1940s, and then you have the modern version of evolutionary theory, which I and other people call the integrated synthesis. Well, Michael Behe spends a great deal of time arguing against the modern synthesis. Why is that argument against evolution just not serious? Because all of this stuff exists. Neutral theory exists. Evo Devo exists. Genomics, deep homology, epigenetics, all of that stuff exists. In a recent interview on the, I think it was the Unbelievable podcast, YouTube show, whatever it is, on this Unbelievable show, uh, Michael B., he said, basically, that all of these new mechanisms, oh, I don't know, he kind of hand waves away. He said, oh, you know, that all reduces down to neo-Darwinism anyway. Neo-Darwinism being the modern synthesis. That's not true at all. There's no place for neutral theory in, mo in the modern synthesis. There's no place for epigenetics in the modern synthesis. There's no place for evolvability as a phenotype in the modern synthesis. So I'm, as I often am with creationists, left to wonder if Michael Behe is deliberately misrepresenting what evolutionary theory is, or if he simply does not know what evolutionary theory is. So, option one, irreducible complexity is not even relevant to the question of can something evolve? And I want to be clear, this is the best interpretation of Michael Behe's argument if you just read plainly what he says. But that's not the only potential interpretation of his argument. Option two is that he's saying all the mechanisms are included, and even including all those mechanisms, irreducibly complex systems absolutely cannot evolve. Right, that's your hypothesis. We include every evolutionary mechanism. Irreducible complexity is an insurmountable barrier to a thing evolving. Now, if you state it like that, a single instance of a system that has irreducible complexity evolving is sufficient to falsify the hypothesis. So what do you think? Spoiler, we've witnessed systems that meet Behe's criteria evolve. 
I'm going to give you one example because it's something I'm very familiar with and find very interesting. It's a protein in HIV-1 group M called VPU. This is a protein that's found not just in HIV, but in the SIVs, that's the simian immunodeficiency viruses. It's a related group of viruses that infect things like monkeys, uh, chimps, gorillas, and HIV evolved from one of the SIVs, uh, the, the main group of HIV, I should say, evolved from one of the SIVs that infects chimps. So this protein VPU in HIV-1 group M, it has a novel function. Its job in humans is to neutralize tetherin, which you can see on the right right here. What VPU normally does, and you don't have to worry about like the specifics of this, but what VPU normally does is it deals with a protein called CD4. In HIV-1 group M, it does a second job. It deals with a protein called tetherin, which is part of the human immune system. Other apes have tetherins as well, um, but uh, the SIVs have different ways of dealing with them. Now, is this novel trait irreducible? Yes, this novel functionality of VPU is in fact irreducible. There's been a lot of work on this. It requires at least four specific point mutations. One study from 2008 found that there are two specific regions within the VPU uh, protein, the human uh, uh, infecting VPU protein, and if you swap out those regions with the chimp version, then it loses its ability to antagonize tetherin. A later study, I think that one was in 2008, and then a later study, which I'm showing a bit of here, figure here, from 2010, found that within one of those regions, there are three specific mutations, and you can see them highlighted right here, or in this figure with the arrows. There are three specific mutations that are required for this uh, tetherin antagonism. If you remove those mutations, then you don't have a functional intermediate. It's basically an on-off switch. Now, those three mutations are in one region, and there's a second region, so that means you have three plus whatever's in the other region, you have at least four specific point mutations required for HIV-1 group M VPU to be able to antagonize human tetherin. That is an irreducible trait according to Michael Behe's criteria. Now the cool thing here, and the problem for Michael Behe, is that this trait evolved recently, like in the observable past. There are no variants of SIV-CPZ that's uh, SIV chimpanzee, which is where HIV-1 group M evolved from. Um, there's no variants of that virus or that viral uh, VPU that neutralizes tetherin, whether human tetherin or chimp tetherin. It just doesn't do it. Now, HIV-1 evolved from SIV CPZ in the early 20th century. You can see that in this figure right here from a 2014 paper. 1900, no HIV. 1920, no HIV. 1930, HIV. 1940, HIV. 1950, HIV exists. This new function was one of the traits, not the only one, but one of the traits that actually allowed for the mutated variant of SIV to jump into humans. So in 1900, this trait is not there. In 1910, it's not there. But by 1930, it's probably there. And by 1940, it's definitely there. So we know when this new trait evolved, meaning within the observable human past, just in the last century or so, We've seen the evolution, we've witnessed the evolution of an irreducibly complex trait. So if you go by the second definition of irreducible complexity or the second form of the irreducible complexity argument, then irreducible complexity is falsified. And I want to be clear, this is just one example of several. There are other examples like this, some of which we've actually uh, found in the lab. Same thing. Once you can watch something that meets Behe's criteria evolved, you have falsified this second version of the argument. But there's still a third version of the argument. In option three, all the mechanisms of evolution are included and some irreducibly complex systems can evolve, but some cannot. So even though we can document the evolution of some IC systems, it's always theoretically possible that there's gonna be some system out there that has irreducible complexity that cannot evolve. Probably see the problem with this argument, it is untestable and unfalsifiable, and therefore it doesn't merit any further comment. This is an unfalsifiable argument. It can never be falsified. You can find as many systems as you want that, can, that have irreducible complexity, and you can witness their evolution, and it will never uh, remove the possibility from consideration that somewhere out there, there is an IC system that cannot evolve. So this is an unfalsifiable argument. So option three, under this uh, version, under this way of making the argument, irreducible complexity is unfalsifiable, and therefore it's unscientific, and we can discard it. It's not a serious idea. 
So to summarize, irreducible complexity was proposed as a refutation to evolution by Michael Behe in 1996's Darwin's Black Box. There are three main ways you can interpret the irreducible complexity argument against evolution. All of them are invalid, and let's review why. Our first question is, does the argument permit all evolutionary mechanisms? Version 1 of the irreducibly complex argument does not. And since it does not, irreducible complexity doesn't even address the question of whether a structure or system can evolve. If the answer is yes, we do permit all of the, all of the mechanisms to operate, then the question becomes, can some irreducibly complex systems evolve? If the argument that Michael Behe is making is that no, absolutely not, no irreducibly complex systems can evolve, well, then irreducible complexity as an anti-evolution argument is false. It has been falsified because we have witnessed and documented the evolution of systems that meet Behe's definition of irreducible complexity. But we could also say yes, maybe some irreducibly complex systems can evolve, but some definitely can't. Well, when you make the argument like that, that's the third version of the argument, the concept is unfalsifiable as an anti-evolution argument. There's always the possibility that somewhere out there we might find that mythical irreducibly complex system that can evolve. But there's no way to test that. It's not a serious scientific argument. Now there is one more thing I want to touch on, and it's the possibility of a fourth option. It's possible that Behe could argue, or someone else could argue, that irreducibly complex systems can in fact evolve, but only because of some supernatural input. For example, God intervened to guide HIV-1 group M VPU evolution, and that is why it was able to acquire an irreducibly complex trait in the modern history, the documented modern history. Now this argument is also untestable and unfalsifiable. And I don't think anyone is actually making this argument, but just in case this is a way that somebody potentially could interpret the irreducibly com uh, the irreducible complexity argument against evolution, uh, so just want to address that here. So, is irreducible complexity a viable argument against evolution? Nope, that is a creation myth. And going all the way back to 1996, it's an oldie but a goodie. I really like this one. It's you know it's fun to to hit the wayback machine once in a while instead of uh, responding to what somebody said last week or what somebody wrote last week. So anytime irreducible complexity comes up as an anti-evolution argument, now you know why it is wrong and you can refute it. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Remember, everybody, don't get fooled.